Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome to Research Conference at DCRI. It's a real pleasure today to introduce Ben Steinberg, who um, has, uh, has done some wonderful things in his uh, time here at Duke. Prior to coming to Duke, he started off in medical school at um, Harvard, uh, sorry, Hopkins, and um, during that time uh, earned a prestigious Saranoff Fellowship where he went and studied with the Timmy Group for a year, and then completed his residency at Hopkins before coming to Duke to uh, the Cardiology Fellowship Program where he's been involved with the Orbit AF trial um, from the early days and has um, really been instrumental in its expansion and done some exciting stuff. And uh, today he'll be sharing some lessons uh, from that experience with us. So thank you. Thank you. <coughs> so thank you for having me. Thanks to everybody for coming. Um, today uh, I hope to share with you some of the data, some of the things we've learned from the uh, Orbit program and the Orbit experience. Um, by way of disclosures, I have no personal disclosures, but uh, the program is funded by a grant from Janssen Scientific Affairs. Uh, the, the first major point uh, I want to convey is that the Orbit program is really a, a team effort, that I'm here presenting data really on behalf of an extraordinary team here at the DCRI. Um, as you can see, the leadership, Dr. Puccini, Dr. Peterson, and Beth Fralo, there's an external executive committee um, that directs the study, but really all the people on the slide here uh, make it happen. Uh, many of our here in the audience, so I appreciate your support. So um, thank you, and I, I'm really here on behalf of this extraordinary team. <coughs> By way of introduction, for those of you that are non-clinicians or non-cardiologists, atrial fibrillation is the most common cardiac uh, rhythm disturbance. Uh, it's a rhythm problem of the upper chambers of the heart uh, that beat irregularly and quickly. This leads to an irregular uh, heartbeat, uh, frequently symptoms. Uh, it's rarely a, a lethal arrhythmia, but as we'll see, can have um, other disastrous consequences. Atrial fibrillation, uh, the prevalence is increasing dramatically. This is a classic uh, slide by Alan Goh uh, demonstrating the um, expected or projected rise in prevalence of AFib uh, over the next several decades uh, in this country. S so um, <clears throat> in addition to symptoms, uh, it's estimated that approximately one-fifth of all strokes are related to atrial fibrillation uh, through a variety of mechanisms that we, that we won't go into here. But uh, needless to say, stroke is the leading uh, cause of morbidity and mortality in patients with atrial fibrillation, and worldwide is a leading cause of, uh, of death and disability. It's, inc it's estimated also to increase. Uh, and so um, great attention was paid and investment was made in the prevention of stroke in these patients, and multiple tri trials demonstrated the benefit of warfarin uh, over control, uh, warfarin being the oral anticoagulant over control, uh, for the prevention of stroke or systemic embolism in patients with atrial fibrillation. The next question following all these data were, were how to identify patients in, to appropriately treat. And so several scores uh, were developed to identify patients with atrial fibrillation that were at uh, higher uh, risk of stroke. In other words, not all patients with AFib have the same risk of stroke. Uh, and so two related scores for stroke, the CHADS and the CHADS-VAS scores, uh, capturing things like heart failure, high blood pressure, age, diabetes, prior stroke, uh, vascular disease uh, were developed. And as you can see, uh, by, excuse me, increasing uh, risk of stroke, or excuse me, increasing points uh, by the score, you have increasing rates of stroke. Um, and this has been obviously validated in many different studies uh, and the basis for some of our guideline recommendations. Now, the balance of that is that patients um, who are receiving oral anticoagulation are at significant risk of bleeding. Um, and so a few scores have also been demonstrated to try to estimate rates of bleeding in these patients. Uh, two displayed here are the Atria score um, and the Hasblood score. Again, increasing uh, score leads to, is related to increasing rates of bleeding. Um, and we'll talk about the implications for this. So it's on that background that the Orbit AF uh, registry was designed. And the Orbit AF, at least phase one, is a 10,000 patient registry of approximately 200 sites, enrolling patients that were uh, adults uh, with uh, either new or pre-existing atrial fibrillation that was not thought to be due to re a reversible cause, and that were expected to follow up uh, clinically every six months. Uh, we collected demographics, history, vitals, uh, vital signs, labs, imaging data, uh, importantly pharmacotherapy both for uh, the management of the rhythm as well as the management of stroke prevention in these patients, um, the monitoring of those drugs uh, as well as uh, prior and incident procedures. Naturally, uh, we collected outcomes, uh, the major ones being stroke or systemic embolism in these patients, uh, as well as major bleeding uh, being the, the safety endpoint 
We also collected several other major adverse cardiovascular uh, events during the course of uh, three years of follow-up. <coughs> the primary objectives of phase one of orbit were one, to describe the U.S. atrial fibrillation patient population as a whole with a specific emphasis on these risk profiles. Second, to describe the practice patterns specifically related to the prevention of stroke in these patients. In other words, how are providers uh, prescribing, if are providers are prescribing these medicines to prevent stroke in these patients. Three, uh, we wanted to identify how, the, how this care and how outcomes in these patients is related to those risk, uh, risk uh, stratification profiles I showed. Four, um, no medicine is effective if patients uh, can't or uh, won't take it, and so we wanted to look at uh, compliance and the burden of, uh, of using these drugs in the patient population. In other words, how are they related to quality of life, uh, adverse outcomes, can patients afford them, that sort of thing. Um, and lastly, as many of you are well aware, uh, pharmacotherapy for the prevention of stroke in patients with atrial fibrillation is a highly dynamic field and there are several emerging therapies in the last uh, five years. And so naturally we wanted to assess uh, the impact of those therapies. <coughs> Orbit AF enrolled uh, approximately 10,000 patients from about 184 sites, as you can see, uh, nationally representative here uh, across the U.S. Um, these are just some of the baseline characteristics of the overall population. Uh, again, 10,000 patients, and, um, mean age, excuse me, a median age is 75, 40% female, uh, the majority of white. This largely uh, reflects many of the other uh, cohorts from randomized trials of patients with atrial fibrillation, and we'll, we'll see that in a second. We enrolled patients uh, largely from general cardiology practices, but also from electrophysiology and primary care physicians primary care physicians, including both internal medicine and family medicine providers. The majority uh, were not newly detected AFib. Uh, half of them approximately were paroxysmal, that is the rhythm would come and go. Uh, there would be a normal rhythm some of the time in atrial fibrillation uh, at other times. Uh, and then the remainder was either uh, persistent, in other words, they were in the rhythm unless somebody did something to get them out of it, or long-standing persistent, that is, uh, they were in the rhythm and, and the, the patient's doctors didn't think it was um, either beneficial or um, viable to try to get them out of it over the long term. This just shows the baseline risk uh, distribution in our population of CHADS2 score. Again, the CHADS score being a risk of stroke events. Uh, is a relatively high risk population. The median CHADS score was two, and as you can see, um, the vast majority had two or more uh, points on the, on the CHADS2 score. Uh, similarly, uh, the atria is one of the risk scores for bleeding among several that have been validated. Most of the data that I'll show around bleeding risk score uh, will be related to the atria score. And so this is the distribution in our population. Um, it's, a, it's a little uh, bumpy, for lack of a better term, uh, based on how the score is calculated in terms of three points for one condition, two points for another. Uh, but uh, also is relatively similar to the derivation of cohorts of this score and, and skewed to the lower risk. <coughs> so how does the Orbit F registry compare to other contemporary studies of atrial fibrillation? Here we have uh, on the left two um, contemporary randomized studies of patients with atrial fibrillation that DCRI was intimately involved with, the Rocket AF study and the Aristotle a uh, trial of uh, over uh, you know, 14 to 18,000 patients. And then we have two um, earlier observational studies that were international uh, registries of atrial fibrillation conducted uh, prior to orbit. Um, as you can see the, in the orbit on the end, we enrolled 10,000 patients. Our age was closer to that of the randomized trials. Uh, we had a significant, although minority, of patients with heart failure. Um, hypertension was common, diabetes was common, and approximately 15% had prior stroke or TIA. Some of the difference, as many of you know, uh, regarding uh, the ROCKET trial is that uh, there were inclusion criteria in that trial uh, geared towards enrolling a higher risk population. But uh, overall, uh, the, or the orbit registry represents the largest observational court in the U.S. Uh, and a relatively um, uh, higher risk, uh, relatively representative comorbidities uh, in this population. So that's the baseline characteristics. Um, so what, what, did we, what have we learned so far and what are the questions we sought to answer early on? Um, at this point, uh, most of the patients have done two out of the three years of follow-up. And so follow-up is ongoing, but we have several different analyses we've looked at. And, and the theme throughout, I hope, 
um, to convey is this idea of risk stratification and, and how we treat patients uh, according to risk or how we don't treat patients according to risk. So the guidelines related to anticoagulation in patients with atrial fibrillation are one, that all patients with atrial fibrillation should have their risk of stroke assessed. That is, uh, that by guidelines you should measure something analogous to the CHADS-2 score and try to identify what an objective assessment of their risk is. By definition, everybody in orbit had that. <clears throat> by being in the trial, basically, those data were collected. Second, the guidelines recommend, um, and this is uh, a relative simplification, but essentially oral anticoagulation, systemic anticoagulation for patients with a CHADS-2 score over 2 uh, who are absent contraindication, and, and contraindication we'll talk about, but is, this, but is uh, less well defined in the guidelines. <clears throat> and lastly, uh, there are really no specific, and I say specific, this is relative to the recommendation around the CHADS-2 score. There's no specific recommendation around bleeding assessment in these patients. That is, there's no specific score that the guidelines highlight um, or evidence that using a particular score uh, will change outcomes. And so <clears throat> the first question is, what are contraindications uh, to oral anticoagulation? So these are data that um, Emily O'Brien presented at QCOR this past year. Uh, the first point I'll make is that approximately 13% of our population overall had a quote-unquote contraindication. And I use quotation marks because this is in the eye of the beholder and the provider. Um, you know, many of these things um, are probably uh, will vary depending on who you ask, essentially. And some may not actually re represent quote-unquote contraindications to the medication. So Many will regard having a prior bleeding event as a contraindication, but I think many of us know many patients who receive anticoagulation despite having had a prior bleeding event for a variety of reasons. But approximately a third had a prior bleeding event. A third um, refused to have oral anticoagulation uh, and then down from there. So the two points I, uh, I'd like to make here are that A, uh, contraindications in the eye of the holder, approximately one in 10 in the orbit population um, and, and really uh, vary across the population. <clears throat> now. Despite this, what's the penetrance of oral anticoagulation in these patients? So these are data presented, uh, published by Mike Cullen uh, based on ORBIT and, and CERC outcomes uh, this past year. And essentially what, we, what he looked at were um, on the y-axis, this is kind of rates of anticoagulation use overall. So what percentage of patients were receiving oral anticoagulation for atrial fibrillation? On the x is the CHADS-2 score, so lower risk on the left, higher risk on the right. And on the depth axis is the atria bleeding score. So in the front right column is the highest stroke risk and objectively speaking the lower bleeding risk and as we can see are the highest rates of oral anticoagulation use. Now they're by no means 100% and there's probably a variety of reasons for that, um, contraindications and the like, but essentially it represents the highest rate of anticoagulation use. As you go down by stroke score we see lower rates of anticoagulation use. As you go up in bleeding risk we see possibly marginally less use of oral anticoagulation, that is, uh, potentially bleed, uh, patients that are at highest risk of stroke and lowest risk of bleeding by objective measures uh, getting the um, higher rates of oral anticoagulation, but again, uh, by no means 100%, um, and specifically in, uh, in the most beneficial population. So one of the um, other interesting uh, questions that we formulated into the ORBIT study were this idea that in addition to these objective measures, there are subjective uh, assessments that providers do of patients. That is, we asked the, the provider for the patient to subjectively gauge their stroke and bleeding risk. In other words, however you want to measure it, if you want to use the CHAD score, if you just want to look at the patient, look at other demographics, by whatever measure you want to use, tell us what you think the stroke risk is for the patient, and we gave cutoffs, and tell us what you think the bleeding risk is for this patient. <clears throat> and obviously there are a variety of uh, subsequent analyses and, and questions this will get at, but this is a rather unique aspect of the ORBIT registry. So next we looked at um, anticoagulation rates according to the provider's impression, and these are um, data um, in progress, so we are, we're still looking at these. But what's interesting is, again, <clears throat> on this plot, we have anticoagulation use on the y-axis. We have subjective stroke risk. In other words, what did the provider think was the patient's stroke risk, low on the left and high on the right? And then on the depth axis, we have what did the provider think was the patient's bleeding risk, uh, high up front, uh, low in the back. And so what you would expect is that patients with the highest stroke risk and the lowest bleeding risk in the back here 
um, would have the highest rates of anticoagulation use, uh, and patients with possibly the highest bleeding risk and the lowest stroke risk might have the lowest. Obviously, there's some variation here. Um, there are differences in power in terms of number of patients in each of these buckets, but um, I think we can see that there is some trend to higher uh, use of anticoagulation as your stroke risk increase and some um, mitigation or attenuation of that effect uh, as the provider um, uh, thought the bleeding risk increased. <coughs> so what do we learn about anticoagulation therapy? And again, a lot of these data are in progress, but um, overall, and this has uh, been validated in other studies, that overall use is relatively suboptimal. Um, that is, the patients with the uh, highest risk that are in the guideline recommended cohort of requiring anticoagulation, even if when you take into account 10 percent having a quote-unquote contraindication, uh, we're still not treating everybody that probably should be treated. Um, what drives treatment appears appropriately to be stroke risk, also appears to be bleeding risk, uh, despite a relative uh, lack of data compared to stroke risk, but it also appears to be driven both by objective risk of stroke as well as subjective risk. And again, there are uh, additional analyses uh, we'll be doing to look at that, but we thought it um, uh, interesting and insightful that providers are, are using both what's been published in terms of risk scores, but also their, whatever their gestalt or whatever their own metric was in terms of looking at the patient. <coughs> And we're going to, you know, work on trying to uh, identify what those factors are the provider thought were important. So based on these data, we thought it important to investigate other evidence-based therapies in this population. In other words, patients with atrial fibrillation have many other uh, cardiovascular comorbidities, and there is um, significant evidence for other therapies in those patients, and so not just anticoagulation. So Paul has published these data uh, in the American Journal of Medicine this year. Uh, demonstrating really underuse of other evidence-based therapies, and so, um, and these are these are basically um, oops, beta blockers in patients with coronary disease or heart failure, ACE inhibitors in patients with heart failure, and specific populations in which these therapies are indicated. So, aldosterone antagonism, statin use. You know, a large percentage of patients have their hypertension treated, but a much smaller percentage are uh, actually at goal for their high blood pressure. The penetration of ICD use in these in patients with heart failure and a qualifying ejection fraction, uh, and then overall therapies. And so <clears throat> what we see is similar to data that are presented in the ACS population, the heart failure patient population, patients with atrial fibrillation do not escape the idea that uh, we probably underuse evidence-based therapies that are, have been proven to prolong life and, and reduce morbidity. One of the important therapies that um, has been around a long time, has been proven, is aspirin um, and is um, Studying aspirin uh, never, never gets old because there's always more to learn. Um, guidelines for, re for recommendation with aspirin uh, really are, are rather clear in terms of secondary prevention in patients that have had an MI, particularly those that have had uh, MI, a heart attack recently, um, and that aspirin is beneficial. That's slightly less clear in patients that are also on anticoagulation in terms of the risk and benefit. However, what is clear is that for patients that have never had a cardiovascular event that are on anticoagulation, the risk of aspirin outweighs uh, the benefit. And we know uh, from large studies that um, as benign as many of us may think a baby aspirin a day is, there is a small but significant increased risk of bleeding in patients receiving aspirin. And this is true whether or not the patients are on anticoagulation or not. And so the idea that patients uh, with atrial fibrillation, many of whom are on anticoagulation, may be treated with aspirin. Um, uh, is, an important, is an important question. And so these are data uh, we published earlier this year looking at um, patients with vascular disease and what proportion was treated with just oral anticoagulation and what proportion was treated uh, with concomitant aspirin. And so I'll draw your attention to really the top line, which is essentially that of patients with um, any cardiovascular disease, excuse me, of patients that were receiving um, Oral anticoagulation alone, in other words, no, no aspirin, 37 percent has significant cardiovascular disease. In other words, these are patients that one might make the argument that additional aspirin might be worthwhile, uh, but they weren't getting it. I think more striking is, is in the second group, which is that in this population of patients that received anticoagulation and aspirin, only two-thirds had cardiovascular disease. In other words, almost 40 percent of patients that were treated with anticoagulation and aspirin had no manifest cardiovascular disease. Um, this is important because it's not clear that there's benefit to aspirin in those patients and there might even be harm. And so that was uh, naturally the next, the next question. 
So we looked at bleeding events in those patients. <coughs> And across all, and these are unadjusted data, but across all subgroups, we have bleeding rates on the Y and different subgroups on the X. So age, young and old, prior bleeding, no or yes, and again, the atrial bleeding risk score. Patients in red that were getting aspirin in addition to the anticoagulation had higher rates uh, of bleeding. Now, the, the numbers on top indicate the numbers of events, and so naturally, um, fortunately, it's an uncommon event uh, for the patient. Unfortunately, that makes... Um, conclusion is difficult, but it, there is generally a trend that adding aspirin to these patients <coughs> increases the risk of bleeding. So uh, lastly, the question of, you know, after we adjust for risk, uh, what does this look like? So here are uh, the adjusted endpoints for patients uh, compared between oral anticoagulation alone, anticoagulation with aspirin. This is everybody, those that had, those that had cardiovascular disease and those that didn't, so the entire cohort. And what we found is that among the endpoints of major bleeding, uh, nuisance bleeding, hospitalization, and cause specific hospitalization, that the addition of aspirin was significantly associated with increased risk of bleeding and increased risk of uh, bl uh, a bleeding related hospitalization, which is many of the clinicians know, uh, if you're bleeding enough to be hospitalized for it, that's, that's no small event. Uh, and so this certainly suggests uh, harm associated with the use of aspirin. Um, the patients that are on anticoagulation have relatively uh, very low rates of ischemic events, myocardial infarction, a stroke, that sort of thing. And so it really makes it challenging to identify if there is any benefit to aspirin in those patients. Um, and so uh, our conclusions uh, stopped at, the, at, the, at this signal. <coughs> so what did we learn from the use of evidence-based therapies in patients with atrial fibrillation? One is, is that, generally speaking, there is probably suboptimal impl implementation in these patients, and unfortunately, that's consistent with other disease states, heart failure uh, and acute coronary syndromes, and so we have room for improvement. Secondly, patients um, often without a strong indication uh, are treated with um, therapies that may increase their risk uh, to little benefit, and I think that that's an important message that came out of our aspirin data, which is that um, many of us see these patients in clinic that are on warfarin or they're on some anticoagulant. They may be taking aspirin because they're prescribed to, or they may be just taking aspirin because um, they think it's, you know, it's healthy, everybody's on an aspirin, it's over the counter, they can buy it at their pharmacy, um, and, and the attention that we need to, to pay with that uh, probably deserves uh, to be greater. So our next uh, focus was the idea of there are new therapies for oral anticoagulation in patients with atrial fibrillation. Phase one of the ORBIT study um, caught the beginning of dabigatran, which as many of you know is a novel an oral anticoagulant, and so we wanted to look at um, how, again, according to risk, how is this therapy being implemented in the atrial fibrillation population? <coughs> so these are data that DJ Holmes presented at, at QCOR this past year, uh, and we looked at, of the patients in orbit, um, this first group is those that were on warfarin at baseline. What proportion were started on this new drug, the bigotran, during follow-up? So the first point I'll make is that, and this is uh, one year of follow-up, is that a relatively small proportion, approximately 8 to 10 percent, was started on dabigatran from their warfarin. And I think for many of us that were very eager to have a new therapy uh, and a new alternative to warfarin, this was a little bit of a surprise in that I think a lot of people expected this therapy to take off. There are probably many reasons for this, but, um, but it was relatively low. Now, again, this is early in the dabigatran release, and so there are some caveats. But the other conclusion, or the other um, point I'd like to make is that across all measures, so age, um, type of AF, CHAD score, and others, um, it is essentially the lower risk patient that was switched to dabigatran. So they were younger, they um, had more recent onset AFib, and their CHADS2 scores were significantly lower. We also looked at patients that were not on or oral anticoagulation at baseline, uh, and what proportion of, of those patients started dabigatran during follow-up. In other words, for whatever reason, they weren't being treated with warfarin uh, during their baseline visit, but somebody decided to start them on dabigatran, and we thought that represented a unique population from the patients that were on warfarin at baseline. So again, we'll note that, oops, excuse me, um, that uh, approximately 8 to 10 percent were started de novo uh, with dabigatran at follow-up, <coughs> relatively lower than we might expect. And again, it was the younger patient. Uh, the patient with more recent AFib, and the patient with lower CHADS2 scores. Um, and we thought this, uh, again, these are unadjusted, but relatively insightful in that, um, you know, the, 
the data on dabigatran and, and reduction of stroke generally with a new therapy is the highest risk that might derive the most benefit from a therapy, particularly uh, dabigatran, which was superior to warfarin. Um, and so, you know, our next step was really, you know, what is driving this switch? What are the patients that are really getting switched to this new therapy? Um, and, you know, is there a risk signal there? So this, um, so this slide is factors that were associated with the switch from warfarin to the bigger train. In other words, going back to the patients that were on warfarin at baseline, what were the factors that were associated in a multivariable model uh, with the transition to this new drug during follow-up? Um, what, what I'd like to call your attention to is that the, uh, on the right is more likely to switch to bigger train, on the left is less likely. There are factors largely related to the patient, their education level, um, uh, and, and their racial status that really at the opposite ends of the spectrum uh, were associated with switch to dabigatran. Now I'd like to contrast this with the next slide, which is the patients that were started on dabigatran de novo. In other words, they were not on anticoagulation to begin with, and somebody thought that it was appropriate that they now be treated with this new drug. And so what we noted here is that it's <coughs> the factors that were associated with uh, dabigatran start, dabigatran, excuse me, the starting of dabigatran, one were uh, the current use of an antiarrhythmic, in other words, how they're um, their AF uh, was treated, uh, the status of their AF, paroxysmal versus new onset, uh, and then their rhythm at baseline. Uh, not surprisingly, contraindication to warfarin was also uh, associated, but um, unlikely to, to adopt a bigger trend. But um, what I wanted to highlight here is that these are different types of characteristics in the patient that was transitioned from warfarin. In other words, that patient was a patient um, with specific patient characteristics, and this patient uh, was a patient um, with specific disease characteristics. We didn't see a lot of risk of stroke factors uh, in these models, which is also another important, uh, important lesson. So what did we learn from the dabigatran data? One was that it's implemented in the relative minority, um, and this was consistent with uh, some other administrative data, but really in a focused AFib population with providers that were motivated, they're participating in a somewhat of a quality improvement study reporting outcomes. Um, the implementation of this new drug is relatively low. Now, again, the caveat being that this is very early in the dabigatran release, and so uh, data now um, in the current era probably are, uh, might, might be a little different. Second, that the use of this therapy was paradoxically in the younger, uh, healthier uh, disease state, uh, whereas the benefit uh, likely is in the higher risk patient. Um, and then, uh, again, adoption was driven by a variety of factors. It differed from whether you were on warfarin at baseline or not, and it largely did not seem to track with risk of stroke or risk of bleeding necessarily. Um, and so we thought those were important lessons. <coughs> so. Unfortunately, stroke is not the only uh, bad thing that happens to our patients with atrial fibrillation. A variety of uh, adverse events can occur. Um, these are data looking at the financial costs of atrial fibrillation. On the left is the pie chart essentially of costs across the U.S. Um, the right upper quadrant really is the drugs um, and outpatient care. The vast majority is direct and, in, in, and indirect inpatient costs for atrial fibrillation. Uh, and this was in uh, 2005 dollars, but essentially $7 billion, the majority spent on inpatient costs. And then when you compare these, the data on patients um, with or without AFib, there's a staggering difference in inpatient costs between those with AFib and those without. And this is, uh, these are data from uh, a single uh, private payer group. <coughs> so. For us, the, the question was, okay, so we've identified uh, risk factors for stroke and how they're treated. Um, what about hospitalization uh, in patients with atrial fibrillation? So first was the striking incidence uh, of first uh, hospitalization in patients in orbit. And so this is one year of follow-up, and essentially um, we had uh, almost 40 percent, close to approximately a third of patients experienced a hospitalization during one year of follow-up, broken down between cardiovascular, other, and bleeding. And so the, the majority being cardiovascular or non-cardiovascular, non-bleeding um, reasons for hospitalization. <coughs> so the next question was, well, what's really the hospitalization burden? Is everybody just getting hospitalized once, or are there multiple hospitalizations occurring during follow-up? Um, Two-thirds had no hospitalizations, 
Unfortunately, 10% had more than one hospitalization event during follow-up. So this isn't a one-time event for patients with atrial fibrillation. Uh, a large portion of patients have multiple hospitalizations contributing to the significant cost that we, that we observed. When we break it down between patients that experienced a hospitalization and, ex and those that, uh, excuse me, experienced any hospitalization on the right and experienced no hospitalization on the left, we found, as you might expect, significant differences. These are unadjusted data naturally. Um, but uh, essentially older, um, uh, borderline more likely to be female, certainly higher CHADS uh, 2 scores. I've highlighted two other uh, items here. One is uh, the profound differences in EHRA scores. So the EHRA score, for those of you who aren't familiar, is a, is a way of assessing uh, AFib symptoms, very analogous to the New York Heart Association score for heart failure. Essentially, do your symptoms interfere with your daily activity and to what extent do they interfere? Do you have AFib but you can do anything you want? Or do you have AFib and when you have AFib, you can't do anything, you're essentially bedridden because you're so symptomatic? Uh, and so that's the scale from one to four. And essentially those with the um, much higher um, uh, symptom scores are more likely to be hospitalized. Similarly, those with uh, more advanced heart failure are also much more likely to be hospitalized, which will come as no surprise to, to many of you um, from the heart failure, heart failure realm. <coughs> now, when we look at different subgroups uh, in cause-specific hospitalization, we see notable differences in terms of increased risk of hospitalization as you get older, um, borderline differences in the genders. Um, a major difference in patients with uh, heart failure, and then certainly differences in patients with increased uh, CHADS, uh, CHADS 2 scores. Um, excuse me, the y-axis is, is rate of hospitalization. We'll also note that while cardiovascular hospitalization makes up roughly a half, and there are other, cause, there are other causes of hospitalizations that make up the, roughly the other half, that is patients with AFib have other non-cardiovascular diseases, they're not bleeding, they have other things going on that are driving their hospitalizations and driving the cost of these patients. And then the yellow is the bleeding hospitalization. Now, I think it's a little deceiving that it's uh, a relatively small proportion of uh, the overall hospitalization burden, but uh, a lot of patients have bleeding events that don't come to require hospitalization care. And so the idea that, um, at least in the heart failure population, there were five uh, per 100 patient year bleeding hospitalizations really is a, is a relatively uh, high incidence of bleeding hospitalization and quite an adverse event and, and bleeding often tracks with, with lots of other bad things. Um, and so not an insignificant burden of bleeding hospitalization. So <clears throat> the next question is, was what, what really drives the hospitalizations in these, in these patients? And so, um, oops. And so this is uh, the, the multivariable model predicting first all-cause hospitalization in this population. And I've I've really uh, enlarged the, the major and the highest uh, predictors. Um, from the data we just looked at, it's probably no surprise uh, to this audience that uh, advanced heart failure really is the biggest predictor of hospitalization, as is um, increased heart rate uh, and um, uh, intermediate, uh, cause, uh, intermediate uh, stage of heart failure, uh, class two. Directly below that, however, is, is severe symptoms, uh, which I think is intriguing, but many of us will agree that it's very hard to tease out the severe uh, HAFib symptoms uh, from uh, heart failure symptoms. And so um, the, the first take home here is that um, patients with AFib and heart failure, we well know, is a, is a very poor combination of poor prognostic is, um, uh, yields uh, unfortunate outcomes. Uh, and in our popula population with AFib, is, heart failure is really what drives hospitalization. But what if we take the, the heart failure patients out of the cohort? Well, so this is now predicting hospitalization in patients with atrial fibrillation that don't have heart failure. Uh, and the question is, what drives their hospitalizations? <clears throat> Still, we see principally that it is uh, the major driver is those with severe uh, AFib uh, symptoms, um, as well as increased pulse may be a marker of poorly controlled AFib. Um, and then, again, um, other concomitant illnesses. And so. We, we took this as validation that, yes, heart failure patients drive hospitalization in patients with uh, atrial fibrillation, but even in, in those without heart failure, their symptoms uh, really are a marker uh, of uh, prognosis and adverse events in patients uh, with atrial fibrillation. Again, observational data, uh, well-controlled multivariable model, but um, we're going to stop it making any uh, causal uh, association here. So what conclusions did we draw from, from the hospitalization data in these patients? 
One is that uh, hospitalization represents a major burden of care in patients with atrial fibrillation. We see that from the financial data, and we see it in the orbit uh, AF data that hospitalization occurs frequently. It's our most uh, frequent uh, event in orbit um, and it contributes to cost. This is for both cardiovascular, as we would expect in this population, but it's also for other causes. Um, patients with atrial fibrillation, particularly in our population, have many other comorbidities, uh, and those are also driving their, uh, their hospitalization. In addition to the evidence-based therapies for cardiovascular disease, certainly there's room for improvement for other, other conditions as well. <coughs> um, as we noted, heart, heart failure with the combination of atrial fibrillation is a very poor prognostic sign, and, and hospitalization for these patients is driven by heart failure. Uh, and then lastly, you know, many of us, <coughs> or many clinicians, I think, are inclined that, uh, that treatment of symptoms is important in AFib, but may not be robust or may not be the hard clinical endpoint. Well, symptoms uh, is, as many of us know, one indication for invasive management, but clearly is an important marker of a patient that is going to have an adverse event. Now, is that because their symptoms are poorly treated? Is that because they're symptomatic and presented to care? There are lots of different potential reasons for that, but the idea here is that, you know, symptoms are important to pay attention to clinically uh, and that they are a marker of a patient that um, is at high risk. So I've shared um, a, a lot of data from Orbit. These are uh, publications uh, coming, ongoing. Um, it's uh, a tribute to the efforts of the Orbit AF team here. Um, but I've hoped to convey some of the early lessons uh, regarding uh, risk in patients with atrial fibrillation uh, in this population. Uh, and so the conclusions uh, that I'd like uh, to come away with are, one, Generally speaking, there's room for improvement in the care of these patients with atrial fibrillation. It's an in, in a growing disease. We saw this in uh, coronary disease. We've seen this in heart failure. Um, unfortunately, we see it again in atrial fibrillation, uh, which is uh, also increasing prevalence. Um, the care, there's room for improvement both in AFib-related and non-AFib-related uh, disease. <coughs> There continue to ex exist risk treatment paradoxes. So even in this population where we have good prognostic scores, at least for stroke, um, it's often the lower risk patients that may be treated more aggressively. Um, and this appears to be true both for therapies that are well established and have a very sound, long evidence base, and also for therapies that are just emerging uh, and may benefit the highest risk patient. And then lastly, that. Um, the greater attention to predicting and treating concomitant risk in these patients, whether it be for uh, heart failure or for hospitalization, uh, is important. And that part of that is treating symptomatic AFib, but part of that is treating the concomitant disease in patients with atrial fibrillation to prevent the, pro uh, the progression to other diseases uh, and other adverse, adverse events. <laughs> and so uh, with that, I will close. Uh, this is uh, most of the ORBIT team that was able to join us. But again, I'd like to thank the entire team, those of you that are here today, uh, that this was a team effort, and um, we hope to learn many more lessons from this phase of orbit and the next phase, which we've just started. So thank you for your attention, and I can take any questions at this point. <laughs>
and uh, ability to come in and get their INR checked and monitored and interactions with that drug might make it less favorable compared to the newer drugs to be a trend, in which case you wouldn't have to get monitored. You wouldn't have to worry that they were given an antibiotic or given something else that they didn't know about uh, that would interact. On the flip side, you could argue that the patients that have cognitive impairments um, really may have compliance issues. You really would like to know if they're taking an oral anticoagulant and how well it's working and, and what their bleeding risk might be, and so that might favor um, the other side. Uh, but I, you know, I think the, um, the, the I, I agree, I was surprised to see that, uh, that there, it, was, it, was, it came out in that. But I think, there, I think there are two ways to look at it, and I think it depends on the patients and the provider. What was the second question? Putting the conclusion that there is still a treatment paradox, doing your presentation, this was less pronounced from my point of view because you said that the stroke risk was actually guiding therapy somehow. Right. Yeah. And that's a little bit different than we have seen in, in, in previous analysis, actually, many other analyses where the stroke risk goes up and the treatment goes down. Right. So, a very clear treatment paradox. So, what is, a, what is about the orbit that we don't see that trend? Right, so I, think there, I think there are two things. Um, one is, I don't know, op the optimist might say maybe we're improving. Uh, that, that's probably hopeful, but I think the awareness of stroke risk certainly is increasing. I think one of the points about the data that I've presented is that many of us, um, or many providers, I think, often associate stroke risk also with bleeding risk, with, which may or may not be true. Uh, and so, really, the effect that we saw of increasing utilization of higher stroke risk uh, often was limited to the lowest bleeding bleeding risk. And so many of, if I'm not mistaken, a lot of the prior data um, really uh, appropriately so looked at predominantly stroke risk um, and may not have included uh, a bleeding risk. And so I think that's one factor. The other factor here is, again, this is um, an observational register with motivated providers and in some ways is a quality improvement study. Uh, and so it, there may be some selection there as well. Uh, but I think the stratification by bleeding risk uh, was, was rather informative for us. <coughs> Um, I also have two questions. Um, I, I maybe I should know this, but um, could you tell me something about the sites that were chosen in the first place for the study right. in terms of what proportion of these sites were private practice community sites and right. how many of them were academic and whether they were sites that at all participated in prior randomized trials that right. might be a different population? That's a, that's a great question. So the site selection plays into the results that we find. Um, excuse me. It was an outpatient-based study, so most of the practices will be private practice clinics, excuse me. Um, so that's the majority, but certainly, um, you know, through the, the DCRI and the site selection, there is some prior experience in, in trials and clinical trials. Um, you know, certainly that helps in terms of quality of the study. There is some selection there. I think uh, even despite that, we were a little surprised by the, the uptake of novel therapies uh, in, this, in this population of sites. Um, but I, I think it's, it's a fair point, and it's one of the things that we are uh, very sensitive to in our analyses, which is the, the adjustment of different site variability uh, characteristics. But the majority uh, will be uh, private uh, clinics. The other question also had to do with the switch to Bigotran. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I didn't see it in there, and you may not have the data available, right. but it would be really interesting to look at what percentage of those patients had um, insurance that covered the cost of their medications. Right, and that's, that's a great point. I did not show uh, that data. The, there are significant differences, as you can imagine, in payer between the groups that switched and did not switch. It didn't necessarily fall, I, it, I think it fell out in one of the multivariable models, but was um, probably relative to our clinical experience less than you might expect. In other words, I think many of us in clinical uh, practice, that is a major factor in our decision to start a novel anticoagulant for the patient. Um, it did, it was certainly significant at the univariate level in terms of the population of patients that did or did not adopt a Bigotran, but didn't, I think surprisingly, was not as strong in the multivariable models. Did that answer your question? Yeah, the uh, front page article in the New York Times on Sunday was about cost of <laughs> Yes, I saw that. I saw that. It's, yes, it continues to be a problem. I think, you know, as, as more therapies come online, um, you know, payers will be able to negotiate with three different of the same type of drug, potentially, uh, and so that may, that may have an influence. One question back. Um, I mean, is it, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, the, the patients were admitted to the hospital for bleeding event. Mm -hmm. Were they you know, major bleeding or ma ma minor bleeding? 
is there any information regarding this event? Yeah, so that's a great question. We differentiate between a bleeding-related hospitalization and a bleeding event. And so we, we collect specific data on bleeding events irrespective of whether the patient was hospitalized. And the, the primary safety endpoint is by um, ISTH criteria, uh, International Society of Thrombosis Hemostasis, which has been used in many recent studies. And so those are essentially by hemoglobin drop, by critical site of the bleed, um, et cetera, et cetera, uh, transfusion uh, amount. Uh, and so the endpoint, for example, in the aspirin data, the major bleeding, that's the, the major bleeding. Um, in terms of the hospitalizations, we mainly collect essentially was the patient hospitalized for bleeding or not. And essentially, no matter how small or, or big that bleed was, by the virtue of the fact that they were hospitalized, indicates to us that it was a fairly significant event if that's the primary uh, indication for bleeding. But so that's how we categorize them. Thank you. Yeah. Um, nice presentation, man. Thank you. So a nice summary of your work. I'd be interested in your perspective on the lessons you learned from the first phase as you move into the second phase and what changes you guys have made. That's, that's a great question. As many of you know, we're starting phase two, which is uh, an additional 15,000 patients with a focus on these new therapies. Since Orbit 1 was started, uh, dabigatran and two more and probably another will have been approved uh, for oral anticoagulation. And so um, the, the focus of the next phase is really identifying uh, treatment patterns and similar objectives around those different agents. Um, you know, we um, we learned a lot about data collection and how to uh, how to manage events uh, and the dates around those events. I think the idea that risk plays into treatment will be even more important in terms of uh, assessing out you know how patients decide which agent, or excuse me, how providers decide which agent agent to use, um, and then. I think there are um, many different uh, management decisions that uh, you, you and I well know we struggle with clinically uh, that we hope to get at in orbit two that were um, less paramount in orbit one given that uh, we'd had 50 years experience with warfarin which was the predominant anticoagulant here. Phase two will include anticoagulants for which we have less than 10 years of experience with and so the lessons we can learn in terms of management of patients uh, taking those agents I think is, is really a, a, a major component that we're hoping to, uh, to move forward with. Just a quick question to add to that. That was a wonderful presentation. Thank you. Um, which quality gaps, if any, will you be trying to target and narrow as you move forward into phase two? Now, I think this is partly a challenge and partly a moving target, um, A, because the guidelines are about to be updated, and B, because um, even when you ask a Harvard Women's Society and Medicare to try to identify um, quality metrics um, by evidence, they're less than perhaps we would hope. So I think you know it's the big picture. It's making sure really patients are that are high risk are identified. That you know, and this is part of the subjective data. Is saying you know, well, the provider thought this patient was low to intermediate risk, but by every other objective measure, the patient's at really high risk. And so, um, really teasing that out and, and increasing awareness for that phenomenon, I think, is important. The next step, logically, is to really try to implement therapies uh, in those appropriate patients to prevent stroke. And I think you know, we we we. Um, these days are making a big deal about which agent to use, uh, which is better, which is safer, which is more appropriate for which patient. Uh, but the bottom line is any of them is better than nothing. Um, and so the idea that even in the highest risk patients where maybe approaching 70 to 80 percent therapy, that may be better than some historical uh, conditions and some historical controls, but I think uh, we can improve on that. And so in, you know, uh, identifying and improving awareness for that phenomenon, I think, is paramount. Um, from there, I think a lot of the work is to identify really what the strongest uh, quality metrics are. Um, certainly bleeding is up there. Uh, it's something we've struggled with as a clinical community in terms of how to predict bleeding and how to deal with it. Uh, and so I think we hope to learn more about that um, prior to making kind of quality metrics around it. So, thank you. Thanks. I'll ask one last question, then. This is the danger of having a nephrologist with a mic. So I didn't see any <laughs> kidney disease-related information except for one line of dialysis. Did you guys measure kidney function? And it's been, obviously, a very strong confounder in studies like this when we look at risk paradox, especially for cardiovascular therapies. Did it play a role at all? It does. So, uh, Naturally, we, we did, of course, measure it. Um, it's less uh, relevant for warfarin-treated patients, naturally, but certainly highly relevant for the novel agents, and as you state, uh, highly relevant in general to, to risk. It does um, play a role in many of our models in terms of assessments of GFR and eGFR. Uh, it is ironic that uh, not in the data that I, that I showed necessarily. In the hospitalization, it does play out um, to a lesser extent than what we saw. 
uh, but certainly is related. You're, you're probably familiar with uh, John Puccini's uh, data from Rocket, uh, adding uh, renal function to the CHADS2 score, so he has his R2 CHADS2, uh, which uh, remains to be validated. But it certainly is an important driver, and we, we do see it in multiple, many of our models driving adverse events. <coughs> Thank you. Oh, thanks. My pleasure. Thanks. Thank you. So I should turn this off, probably, huh?